Washington, where there is major news out of Capitol Hill. The fate of the House Speaker now in jeopardy. But when the White House press briefing started earlier today, politics for a moment took a back seat. These, the first remarks from the White House press secretary as she took to the podium. Our thoughts are with the Duchess of Cambridge and her family members and friends during this incredibly difficult time. And certainly we wish her a full recovery. I know folks are going to ask if uh, the president has uh, spoken to her or the family. I can just say right now that I, we don't have anything to share at this time. Karine Jean-Pierre earlier today. Come on in. I'm Blake Berman, and this is The Hill on News Nation. All right, here we are, here we go. Hanging out with us today, Chris Steyerwalt, host of The Hill Sunday and senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Julia Manchester, national political reporter for The Hill. Scott Bolden is a News Nation contributor, former DC Democratic Party chairman. And Denise Gitsum, News Nation contributor, Republican strategist as well. Hello to you all. Happy Friday. We made it to the end of the week. We got a lot going on. I'll tell you what, we didn't get to go into the weekend with, with no news. I'll, I'll tell you that much. Here in Washington, Mike Johnson's uh, job. There's real questions about that. Donald Trump today talking about maybe he wants a new Supreme Court case. We'll get into all that uh, here in a second. But first, it was the announcement, the shocking announcement heard around the world. Kate Middleton revealing today that uh, she has been battling cancer, undergoing chemotherapy following major abdominal surgery. With all the rumors surrounding her whereabouts, the 42-year-old mother of three explaining that she and Prince William just needed some time to explain to their children what was happening to mom. It has taken me time to recover from major surgery in order to start my treatment. But most importantly, it has taken us time to explain everything to George, Charlotte and Louis in a way that's appropriate for them and to reassure them that I'm going to be okay. The news dropped at about 2 o'clock Eastern. Uh, Julia, we heard from, from the White House immediately afterwards. But when you listen to, uh, there to, to Kate Middleton, what'd you hear? What I hear is a mother of three and a wife who happens to hold the title of the Princess of Wales. And that's what's so interesting to me about the royal family is that you have human, human beings who are flawed just like us in this major position of power, this over a thousand year old institution in the UK. And we sort we, we watch them and we sort of put them on pedestals to think they're almost superhuman in a way. But this has reminded us that this is a human being going through what many of us go through. But with the royal family, what makes it more difficult than other families is that they are essentially, they call themselves the firm. They are a hmm. business. They're an institution. Yeah. So they are held to a higher standard when it comes to issues like public relations. Now, was there public relations strategy here? Was there open to criticism? Absolutely. But in terms of the timing of this, why they waited for so long, I've heard a lot of theories, you know, this one argument that they should have just put this to bed weeks ago when these rumors started. But you heard right there that the reason why this human kids. being <coughs> was kids, yeah. didn't want, wanted to wanted to tell them. Young mom, three things. kids. Uh, you yeah. in your and sphere? Who, I mean, who couldn't relate? I mean, she expressed vulnerability, fragility, bravery, and honesty. And she was dressed simply like any one of us would have been, just talking to a camera with no makeup, just expressing her heart. And I think this is going to cause a lot of people to eat their words in the press, especially people like John Oliver, who said some horrific things that they're going to really have to walk back. Yeah. All right. Moment to sit back and reflect. And then there's politics. <laughs> back on over to Capitol Hill right now. And how about this question? Is the circus back in town? Uh. The Republican Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene filed a motion to boot the House Speaker Mike Johnson out of his position after a $1.2 trillion funding deal passed earlier this morning. Now, shortly after, the Congresswoman spoke to our Joe Khalil. The majority of the majority voted against this bill. So it is clear within my conference, um, everyone has lost complete confidence in Mike Johnson as Speaker of the House. It's a matter of when, and from conversations that I've had with my colleagues, many other members have lost confidence in him as well. All right, now this means at some point there could be another vote to see who will be the next Speaker. Last time, you remember when, when this happened, Republicans voted out Kevin McCarthy and nothing got done in the House for not one, not two, but three 
weeks. All right, Chris, um, what's this all about? Is this about Mike Johnson? Is this about Marjorie Taylor Greene? And I'm wondering, in a, in a general election, which we're squarely in, is Donald Trump at some point going to step in and, and, and try to change the, the dynamic and run the show? Well, you're familiar with the concept of luxury opinions or mm-hmm. luxury beliefs. Yep. And, uh, you know, the other news today about the what Russians say is a terrorist attack, um, uh, a slaughter in Moscow at a, at a concert venue. Um, the world, we have all of these foundational big problems going on in the world. And we have a very unstable Russia. We have the ongoing conflict uh, in the Middle East. We have these problems. And what Marjorie Taylor Greene is saying is basically if the House Speaker tries to move any of this foreign legislation, right, any money for Ukraine, any money for Israel, anything for the border, anything that he's going to try to do that the Senate might pass, she will instigate the removal, Mm -hmm. and then it's up to him to whip Democrats. Think about this. Mm -hmm. Then he's got to go to Democrats and say, can you save my job? Will you save my job for me as Speaker? And then how does that set Mike Johnson up with his fellow Republicans? If it's Democrat votes that keep him as Speaker, that is then he's even weaker still. So for people looking for a way out of the weeds here, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene is making it much harder. Is Trump going to step in? Because the last time we did this, last time we watched this in Republicans, Republicans went through this. It was what, September, October, something like that. Mm-hmm. We didn't know who the nominee was going to be. It was oh, Trump, DeSantis, hey, who, who might it be? Now he's the nominee. So does he step in and say, wait a minute here, let's yeah. cut this out? Or Well, who loves chaos more than Donald Trump? <laughs> uh, there was but, the or. But, but, yeah. but uh, if Donald Trump could pick a House Speaker, he'd have picked one before. Okay. You want to see this as a Democrat? You ready for round two, possibly? Or no? It's very confusing. But I will say this. Uh, Green's statement today to the press was this was a warning shot. She did not make it a privilege motion, if you will. And maybe it's a warning, an empty warning, or maybe it's a more substantive warning. What I don't understand about the Republicans... You call, you call him bluff? Uh, I'm, yeah, uh, at this point, because they cannot get it wrong twice in, in a presidential election year. They just okay. simply can't. But maybe they can. But what, what I don't understand is why create this sideshow when, as Chris says, there's so many other foundational things going on. Let, let, it just makes no sense. Let's ask Denise. It's your party. Yeah, and Marjorie Taylor Greene is the gift that keeps on giving to the wrong party, to the Democrats. And she is literally, sh- I'm waiting for the selfie between the two of y'all mm-hmm. and with the little heart thing. I mean, this is this is an absolute disaster in the middle of an election year. And the only thing that I can imagine that it's fueled by is extreme self-interest. She has a constituency that she's speaking to that is very small and, and concentrated. And that's what she cares about more than the welfare of our Ju- country. Ju- Julia, do you think Mike Johnson remains in his job in the upcoming months? You know, that was a sigh before an answer. <laughs> in unprecedented, <laughs> in unprecedented <laughs> times, I would say yes, of course, because we are living in unprecedented times. As Chris mentioned today, we saw a terror attack in Russia. There's foreign policy issues, domestic issues, but I really don't know because I think that particular hmm. wing of the GOP in the House is just hell-bent on blocking any compromise. With yeah, but what's the Democrats. alternative, though? See, this is the part I don't get Chris and Blake and to my, my colleagues. What, what's the alternative? You, you see this filed, you see the hard right, hardliners, and you say, okay, they don't want Mike Johnson. This is a rerun. So then what is it that they want, or what's the alternative that makes any sense? And it, they wanted the alternative to shut doesn't down. make sense. They wanted to shut And down. then what? Is that good for America? They wanted, uh, well, they, they would say yes because they're going to bring Joe Biden to his We're knees. We're going to talk to Bob Good here. Yeah. And, well, you'll get to hear. Yeah. 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 For 30 seconds, uh, but first, as Chris mentioned, uh, Julia mentioned as well that breaking news tonight. Look at these pictures right now out of Moscow. What appears to be a gruesome terror attack on a concert hall just outside of the city. Horrible scene there. More than 40 people at this hour dead, more than 100 wounded gunmen bursting into that concert hall, shooting and starting a massive blaze, as you can see there. Uh, Reuters is reporting that ISIS is claiming responsibility for the attack at the scene in Russia this evening. All right, joining us now, the head of the House Freedom Caucus, the Virginia Republican, uh, Congressman Bob Good. Welcome back here to the Hill. Congressman, appreciate you coming on, as always. So, Marjorie Taylor Greene, today, you heard it, you saw it, we've been talking about it. You run the House, you're the head of the House Freedom Caucus. Does Mike Johnson need to go, Congressman, as you see it? 
Well, this is a performance-based business, and we've continued to pass all the major spending bills, predominantly with Democrat votes. Perhaps it was some progress today that the second half of the omnibus spending bill was passed with only about 90 percent of Democrats voting for it, instead of the literally 99 percent that voted for the first one two weeks ago. And at least uh, majority Republicans came to their senses and refused to fund this government at an increased spending level over the Democrats' omnibus from December of 22, and they refused to fund the government that kept in place all the Biden, Pelosi, Schumer policies that are destroying the country, and frankly didn't give three billion, vote to give $3 billion raise to Secretary Mayorkas for, to bring more illegals into the country more quickly, and frankly to continue to fund this border invasion, especially after we saw what happened in Texas yesterday I'm gonna, when the illegal alien mob yeah. bum-rushed bum -rushed the border officials yesterday. I'm gonna uh, get, this I'm is gonna not get a third world country or banana republic. I'm going to get to that in a second, but I, I didn't directly hear a yes, yes or no, Congressman. Does Mike Johnson deserve to keep his job, in your view? Well, he serves the pleasure of 218 members. I can't make a defense for him as speaker uh, because the, ma the material things that we've done, we've done what Democrats want to do. We're doing what Chuck Schumer so in the Senate to wants to do, go? which Joe Biden will sign. Well, I didn't say that. I just can tell you that I can't make a defense for him at this point. Okay. Um, I heard... You, the last time around, Congressman, were, were very vocal that Kevin McCarthy needs to go. And you were one of the folks who, were, who spearheaded that effort. So what is the difference, Congressman, this time around? It's, it's a lot of the same objections. Passing a bill that, that you don't like, spending, so on and so forth. You just, you just tick through some of the reasons. What's the difference between Kevin McCarthy and, and Mike Johnson? Isn't it, isn't it the same thing, or was it just simply a popularity contest, and, and you didn't like Kevin McCarthy? Well... You've asked a specific question, what is the difference? I'll answer that specific question. Kevin McCarthy had been in Republican leadership for some dozen years and had helped preside over the failures of the Republican leadership, for, again, for about a dozen years. Kevin McCarthy made agreements in order to become Speaker and broke those agreements. He didn't bring a balanced budget bill to the floor. He didn't bring all 12 spending bills to the floor. He didn't bring a term limits bill to the floor. He didn't adhere to the majority of the majority rule. Uh, he did the debt ceiling increase with predominantly de Democrat votes without any measurable, uh, meaningful spending cuts, rather. And in the last week of September, he'd only brought one of the 12 spending bills to the floor that had passed out of the House instead of the 12 that he promised to do by the end of September, which necessitated a change in speakership. And then we found out after he was gone that Nancy Pelosi had, had, he had a deal with Nancy Pelosi to keep him a speaker. Then we also found out after he was gone that he had side deals on top of the debt ceiling deal for more spending that wasn't disclosed to the membership. So, no, I don't wish that Kevin McCarthy okay. was there. And Mike Johnson, admittedly, has been dealt a, a difficult hand and has the most narrow majority in the history of the country. That said, we could do a better job of fighting. We're failing to do that. And I can't defend his performance. You mentioned the border, so let's talk about it, Congressman. Uh, in this bill, border security funding, 1,800 additional Border Patrol agents up to 7,500, give or take more, migrant detention beds, new border security technology uh, to help with uh, detecting fentanyl as it comes across the border. You just voted against that. I know you have reasons for voting against the bill, but what would you say to, to the folks in Texas, to the folks in Arizona, all over this country yeah. even, that, that, that you know what you just voted against that what's your reason thanks for giving me an easy one there you got a president who could immediately secure the border today if he wanted to this is a question of will it's not a question of resources but why would we give him to, more money and, and to bring more Ill why would we give him why would we give him more resources to bring more illegals into the country more quickly which is all that he's trying to do he's not going to use those border patrol officers to repel uh, illegal invaders to the country he's not doing that now he's not going to use those beds to hold individuals until he deports them back to their country of origin what he's going to do is use those resources to bring more illegals more quickly into the country. The Congress has already acted. The House has anyway. He should be calling on the Senate to pass H.R. 2 and promise to sign it into law. So why would we give him more resources to do what he's doing now? Congressman, uh, let me ask you briefly. I know where you stand on Mike Johnson, but do you think that he ends up keeping his job? I, I don't know. Okay, we'll leave it there. Uh, always appreciate your time, sir. Congressman Bob Good, head of the House Freedom Caucus, Republican out of Virginia. Thank you, sir. Talk soon. Great to be with you. Thank you. Yep. Chris? Well, they don't call it the fighting fifth district of Virginia for nothing. <laughs> um, you know, Bob Good, who endorsed Ron DeSantis for president, uh, I'm sure Marjorie Taylor Greene would like to see him punished. <laughs> I'm sure she would like to see him punished 
Uh, and th- what's going on with the Speaker of the House is, uh, a, is, is an extension of an internal fight uh, inside the <coughs> House Freedom Caucus. And what uh, Congressman Good alluded to, uh, we have uh, going to have an even smaller Republican majority. So I'm glad you brought it Congressman up. Mike Gallagher, yeah. Congressman Mike Gallagher of Wisconsin is, going next. Uh, is leaving. That leaves Republicans with one mm-hmm. seat only. They can only lose one. They can, if everybody is present, they can only afford so, to lose one seat on any vote and pass any legislation. So That's Mike, tough. Mike Gallagher is one of the more serious members of, yeah. of the House. He's an adult. He, he's an adult. He said, I'm out. I'm done with this. And then the news today was not only is he out, but he's out April 19th, right? So three, four weeks from now, which, as Chris explains, it, that, that means Republicans, if you have everyone in the House for a key major vote, Republicans can only lose one vote. You know Mike my, my Gallagher yeah. very well. He's incredible. And he's a man of principle who's put his life on the line for our country, serving in the Marine Corps. But what does it say about your party in the House that a guy like that yeah. says, I'm done, I can't deal with this? I mean, what they're seeing is what we're all seeing as a Republican, as a lifelong Republican. I've always understood that message discipline and a united front were so important. We used to have such an ability to watch people from different districts when different interests flourish. And that was the strength of our party. But as scripture says, and Abraham Lincoln repeated, a house divided cannot stand. And unless they want to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat yet again, okay. really folks like you know Representative Good respectfully and Marjorie Taylor Greene need to really assess what they're trying to do because they're letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. And, and Bob, then came Trump. And, uh, and then came that? Trump. I mean, it, after, since 2015, all of the principles, concepts, precepts that the GOP stood for and stands for or should stand for is thrown out the window now. This is Trump's party. It's chaos, corruption, and um, and uh, just a completely different organization. By the way, Julia, real quick, what did you hear out of Bob Good? Oh, my gosh. I mean, just to echo what Chris said, I mean, this is, uh, it's, it's the fight in the district. It's the fight it's in all the district. district. I just, well, it's what I'm thinking of it. All right, by the way, coming up next hour here on News Nation, Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene joins Leland Vitter to discuss why she is uh, keen on ousting the House Speaker, Mike Johnson. That's in about 45 minutes from now, 7 o'clock Eastern, on balance, right here on News Nation. But still to come from us here on the Hill, is Donald Trump set to try to take a new case to the Supreme Court? That is essentially what he is threatening today if Letitia James starts seizing his assets. Plus, have you seen this video from the New York Post? The Congressman Bob Good alluded to it just a little while ago. So what happened as authorities there were presented with that moment at the southern border. And what does Chris Steyerwalt's bracket look like? I'm not talking about hoops. We're talking about your final four and the thing that really matters. Well, the Mountaineers are out, weren't in the tournament this year, so I have lots of free time to look at which states are going to be the key states, okay. the final four states for the presidential election. Chris's final four, Julia's final four on the Senate side of things. There You're going to be, be breaking some overlap there. Could be some overlap. Yeah. Their political brackets coming up when the hill Ooh. on News Nation returns. <laughs> All right, welcome back here to The Hill on News Nation. So have you seen this video? Check this out from the New York Post. More than 100 migrants rushing the border in El Paso, Texas. You can see, look at that. You can see them breaking through the razor wire and even knocking over members of the Texas National Guard. You can hear it now, too. Texas officials reportedly were trying to organize the migrants into groups, but after some women and children got separated, the situation escalated. The White House asked about this scene earlier today. I really, truly believe that's a question for, uh, you know, the Republican governor of Texas. You have a, a, a governor of Texas who has continued to politicize this. I do want to say we are grateful uh, for the Border Patrol's quick work uh, to get the situation under control and apprehend the migrants. Wait a minute, Scott. That's our border, but it's the governor of Texas's responsibility? <laughs> well, the, he's taken it on as his responsibility, or he's trying to. Is that the, is that the answer the you Texas want out of the National White House? Guard. No, I think uh, I'm not crazy about that answer, quite, because I do think that visual right there is why Biden is underwater, or at least being challenged right now, because 
ultimately, they cannot argue that the immigration and the border is solely within the federal purview and the Immigration Act, and at the same time, then respond to that visual right there, which is an awful visual, and say, well, you need to talk to the governor about that because those were Texas um, rangers that were there. Um, you know, Biden's got to do something. What I don't understand about the Democrats, and maybe Chris can weigh in here, is why he won't do something. I don't believe by executive order he can shut it down, so forth and Hold so on. on. But I do think he can do something, and it just seems like he will not pull the trigger. Before we get to Chris, wow. what do you make of that White House response? I just response? love that my dear friend Scott over here has mm -hmm. finally come around to <laughs> No, I, I haven't come around to seeing things your way. What I, I come know. around to saying no, is that visual is why... He's behind Trump right now. He's got to do something about it. I know That's we've won fact. when we've won, Scott. Look, I would just mm -hmm. like to take that clip as a Republican strategist mm -hmm. and just run it over and over every single day in every swing state until November. Yeah, because, we're going to bury that clip. And you know, yeah. exactly. <laughs> you should. Gonna, but just... you know what's really scary, Blake, is the fact that, you know, we had this ISIS now connected incident in Russia. And on March 11th, Christopher Wray, head of the FBI, mm -hmm. actually testified before the Senate about his concern about ISIS related terrorists plotting something and coming through our southern border. So if you're not making the connection, y'all, all of you at home and all of us on this in Washington, D.C., let's get real about the threats that are coming in. If you can't, you can't get real based on what's happening in Russia right now and you've suddenly forgotten everything that's happened with our terrorist past, so, the history, then we need to be reminded let's, every single let's day. Go, let's go back to Scott's question, though. That response from the White House... Yeah, that was bad. Does that show they don't have an answer? Uh, it shows that a spokesperson was trying to get it weaponized back against the other person <laughs> as quickly as possible, right? So she, the first word out of her mouth was Republican yeah. because she, like, I want, I want to pass this hot potato back. I will tell you this. Joe Biden is going to end up taking the hardest line possible on the southern border. Will he do it? When it's all said and done? Yeah, because, like in September, October, beca November? because the two competing videos, if you want to think about the 2024 election as competing video clips, it's that clip and January 6th. Those are your two yeah. violent mob scenes that voters are going to be confronted with over and over again. Which, which one do you like better? And what Biden will do, uh, and Democrats are just going to have to come to terms with this, is decide when he's going to drop the hammer. That's the case? I think it's the case. And remember, this is also happening as we're seeing really a erupting situation in Haiti. And even yep. though Florida is not a border state, it is a maritime state, and that's going to be an issue. All right, mm -hmm. still much more ahead here on The Hill. How Donald Trump? might be several billion dollars wealthier starting next week, in theory, at least on paper. And why you, even if you wanted to, could own a piece of Truth Social. Plus, did you hear about Trump's latest legal threat? He is now invoking the Supreme Court once again. Why the New York Attorney General might want to take notice. Scott probably has some thoughts on this one. <laughs> when the Hill on News Nation returns. Now or later. <laughs> we gotta give you adulthood. That's why vaccines matter so much. For 40 years, Rotary and partners have delivered vaccines globally, like here and even here in your neighborhood and around the world. Rotary is ensuring children grow up safe from preventable diseases. All right, so welcome back to The Hill here on News Nation. So how about this possibility? Another Supreme Court case involving Donald Trump? That is what the former president is now threatening if the New York Attorney General, Letitia James, starts seizing his assets next week. Now, Trump, as you might know, needs to post bond for the more than $460 million uh, fraud judgment against him. Trump telling Fox News in an interview today, quote, they can't take away your property before you've had a chance to appeal the decision of a Trump-hating, incompetent judge who has been overturned more than any judge in the state. But the former president got some financial uh, welcome financial news today as investors approved a plan to take Truth Social public as early as next week, potentially adding billions in stock value, on paper at least for the moment, to the president's portfolio. Uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> no profanity. It's, no, it's just, <laughs> no it's, it's, it's just, you know, it, it's always a lot. You, the clause that, every, when Trump starts, there's so many words that are packed in, so many adjectives that are packed in, it's hard to get it. What about this idea of him going to the Supreme Court if 
Letitia James starts seizing his assets, some of them next week? Well, the law is the law, and he's being treated like everyone else. A couple, couple things to unpack. One, uh, when she makes the application to the court, he can certainly get a hearing for that, but the law is well settled on this. And he, here's the what you ought to be looking at. One, okay. does the parent company of this sale, the SPAC sale, will they give him a waiver to use the $3.5 billion immediately? They could or they could not. That's the first thing. Second of and, all... And by, the, and by the way, to be fair, it then becomes a stock. So it can go up, it could go down, like we don't know. Yeah, he'll dump it. He'll dump it to get the cash. Secondly, the um, here's the thing with any debtor, right? It's not a matter of whether they have the money, right? It's a matter of whether they have a willingness to pay, right? Done a lot of work in this area. Does Donald Trump have the willingness to pay $500 million? He's court ordered to do it. It's legally sound and he's ordered to do it. But that doesn't mean he won't get $3.5 billion or have a half a million, in, a half a billion in cash, as he says, and still fight this okay. because he doesn't believe well, that he owes so, it. So Truth Social goes public. He's got billions coming his yeah. way. Why not wait? Some say, why not wait? Why seize the assets? Just wait. Why not wait? Because they're entitled to the money. Why would they? Well, they'd have to have an agreement okay. to wait six months, if you will. He'd probably have to put up some collateral so I like the, the property. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know, but it well, seems like Well, if both sides are talking, you're right. That'd be very reasonable. But my gut is both sides aren't talking because Donald Trump doesn't make it easy to talk to the other side when he litigates because not only is lawyers unreasonable, but he's unreasonable and he talks okay. bad about people. Hard to cut a deal with someone that you keep talking about their mother or father or playing the dozens or calling them out okay. of their name. All right. <laughs> Didn't even get there playing the <laughs> dozen. Because <right? laughs> you know about that. I know, I know about it. I'm glad to hear There it. was, by the way, speaking of Trump, a story in the New York Times today. It was the lead story, at least digitally, mm -hmm. from the New York Times. Um, let's show it. Inside Garland, Merrick Garland, the attorney general, his effort to prosecute Trump. And here's what it said, quote, in trying to avoid even the smallest mistakes, Mr. Garland might have made one big mm -hmm. one not recognizing that he could end up racing the clock. Did the New York Times just print the quiet part out loud? Yeah. How was it a mistake for the DOJ to say, you know what, or for, for critics to say, you know what, the DOJ should have gone faster because there's an election around the corner? I mean, he just blew the biggest case that the Biden whole administration was counting on him to deliver on, and that's not his first mistake, or at least the first mistake made under his watch the DOJ. Look, I worked for two attorney generals. Is it a mistake, though? I mean, it's it's just him playing, instead of playing checkers, he's playing chess. And Trump is always playing chess. He's always looking ahead. This is a game of strategy. Just because you're the attorney general doesn't mean you just focus on the law. There's a whole political element of it. We saw this under President Bush when I worked for two AGs. One was a politician, one was not. One actually managed to handle things, and one got swallowed alive. You have to be more than just a great attorney or a judge or an academic when you're the attorney general of the United States of so, America. So show, show that, um, that graphic again, if we can, just to put it up on the screen. Inside Garland's effort to prosecute Trump, and they outline the mistakes. Is this about the case or is this showing that the knives are out for Merrick Garland on the left following the her report? Well, we do know that there were certainly uh, people on the left who were unhappy with Merrick Garland, <laughs> unhappy with the news media for how it was reported and I, well, essentially reporting it as it was done. But I would not be surprised if there was some discontent there. Well, maybe there's a combination of all of that going on, but you can't, it's hard to criticize the AG for taking too much time because you want to get it right and being methodical right, that's is part I, of well, being a good prosecutor. Are, but the timing and the delays, you can put that in the calculation. But but let me tell you, if he rushes and makes the mistakes in trying to charge a former president of the United States, the first in the history of this country to do so, I'd rather have the delay and fight the race that gives the time I, than to make a bigger mistake by rushing. One of the most comforting lies that partisans tell themselves is that the reason that they lost was they didn't play dirty enough and they hmm. weren't as bad and rotten as those other people. And I think there are a lot of Democrats in this town who wanted Merrick Garland to be a shell and a political vessel for the what they think Bill Barr, and I think unfairly they thought of Bill Barr, Donald Trump's attorney general, they wanted a hack 
for an attorney general. And here's what I, the bad news for them. Hmm. Eric Garland's not a hack. You can ask his colleagues right. on the district court, uh, district court of appeals in Washington. You can ask people who've worked with him. He is a patriotic, conscientious human being who wants to do a good job. And the lie that these partisans tell themselves right. that they just needed to cheat more uh, is not the correct answer. All right, still to come here from the Hill. It's, it's, it's March Madness, right? Big big time of year for basketball fans. You probably filled out a bracket and, you know, you go through the teams, whatever, whether you're paying attention or not. But how about this? The political Final Four. Other side of the break, you're breaking down. I thought when you said it was my Final Four, I thought I was going to be able to say roast beef, <laughs> ribs, <laughs> bacon, and, and ham. But no, I guess we're going to have to do the top four swing states. So Chris is, is going to show his number one seed swing states, and you have... The Senate. So the, the top Senate races I'm watching. All right, our political brackets on the other side of the break. You're watching The Hill here on News Station. Tournaments begin the week's long march of whittling down their way to the final four teams. How about this question? If we had a final four for the 2024 election, what might that look like? Steyerwalt here to break it all down. Chris? Well, unlike uh, UConn. No, I, I, how much smack should I talk? <laughs> WVU couldn't even make the, the Mountaineers couldn't even make the tournament, so I can't, I can't, I, my smack talk has to be pretty limited. But in our final four swing states, these are the states that at this moment most assuredly will be part of the final calculation for the two presidential candidates. The number one seed is undefeatable, and that is Pennsylvania. So let's, let's look at our scouting report first on Pennsylvania. There it is. It's kind of square. Uh, or it's kind of rectangular. Uh, it's the Keystone State. Uh, Joe Biden won it. Uh, so it's partisan voter index, which is how much more or less Republican or Democratic it is than the rest of the country. Pennsylvania is slightly more Republican than the country as a whole, which makes it still good Biden territory, but not primo. Uh, and it has 19 electoral votes. It's the big prize in this. And we happen to have a new poll uh, from the cable news network that they did, uh, which is 46 to 46. This is his number one seed as you're going to get number one seed. You got the biggest state. It's the state Biden absolutely positively has to win. It's Biden's home state. It's where Trump went to college. He went to Penn. He's an Ivy man. Uh, and it's a, it's a deadlock. Okay. Our other number one seed is Michigan. The Great Lakes state, Lakes, uh, 2020, Joe Biden won it. And it's a little less Republican by one point mm. than uh, Pennsylvania. It's a little smaller. It's the third largest overall electoral vote, but it is hugely important. Look at this. Look at here. Look at this new poll that's out in Michigan. You're going to just, your jaw will drop. Wow. Whoa. Right. Wow. Uh, Trump up eight points in the slightly more Republican Michigan. Uh, the 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 key to victory here for Trump or for Biden is this is about uh, the bench. Right. If we're going to use a basketball analogy, uh, th this is about uh, I'm sorry, this is about driving the lane, which is to say. The reason his numbers are so bad is because you have a lot of younger voters, you have a lot of Arab American voters, you have a lot of people who have beef with Joe Biden, and they're letting him know it. So they're leaving him. He needs to get his base together. Okay, now let's go to some other seeds. Here's Wisconsin. Here's Wisconsin. It's not as big. It's only 10 electoral votes, uh, but it's pretty Republican-y. This is a state that Biden won. It's the Badger state. And this is a, a shooting foul. The story in Wisconsin is a shooting foul. Uh, you don't want to get in foul trouble. Donald Trump has foul trouble in Wisconsin, which is to say that you have a lot of affluent, uh, earnest, well-intentioned suburban voters in places like Ozaki County uh, and other places outside of Milwaukee that just are creeped out by Donald Trump and they don't want to vote for him. Uh, and uh, Trump's ability to be normal, uh, if he can, will be key there. Okay, our fourth, final four, uh, the Grand Canyon State, Arizona. Let's go Wildcats. Uh, the Grand Canyon State, Biden won it. Uh, it's still pretty Republican, uh, and it's a little bigger than Wisconsin. This is the state uh, where uh, uh, help from the bench. We'll say that the key to winning in Arizona is help from the bench. They've got a bad, 
bad U.S. Senate race in Arizona. It's going to be hot garbage out there. They've got <laughs> Carrie Lake, uh, who is trying to move to the middle, versus Ruben Gallego, who's trying to move to the middle from the progressive left. Uh, and this is one of the few races where the down ballot race will actually affect the up va- ballot race. Uh, it's going to be close, close, close. And those are your final four. Here, show the cool graphic. Show it. Do it. Don't make me hold the paper up. There it is. Right. Look at that. See? Great bracket. All right. Styrol breaks it down. His final four, his four one seeds uh, for the big race in November. You've got your Senate races. Show me your, your bracket I, real quick. Yeah, so I'm going to pick, four... pick up where Chris left oh, off. And Arizona, um, he did most of the work for me, but this is so interesting because, as Chris <laughs> mentioned, you have Carrie Lake, very MAGA candidate, moving to the center. And then, of course, you have Ruben Gallego moving to the center as well, very progressive. What interests <laughs> me about Arizona is that it's a border state. Border, obviously a huge issue this election. We'll see at the presidential election, but we're going to see it at the Senate as well. And then moving further up north, but still out west to Montana, you have uh, John Tester, incumbent senator, going up against Tim Sheehy, his Republican challenger. We're seeing very neck and neck race there. The latest Emerson College Hill poll has them separated by two points within the margin of error. Mm-hmm. What makes uh, Montana so interesting is that it is one of the states where an incumbent senator is running where in the same state where that Trump won hmm. in 2020. And that's what leads me to Ohio, also one of those two states that Trump won and that you have an incumbent Democrat uh, uh, um, defending there. Sherrod Brown is a unicorn in Ohio. He's the last statewide elected Democrat in yeah. that state. He's going to face off against Trump backed Bernie Marino. In that primary, Democrats were boosting Bernie Marino because he was the candidate they wanted to win against because he was Trump backed. But that's interesting because Trump also backed J.D. Vance and did not uh, win there. And And then Maryland, real quick, Larry Hogan, former governor. Larry Hogan, former former governor of Maryland, he's on track to likely win that Republican primary. And then, of course, uh, on the Democratic side, that's going to be interesting. David Trone versus Angela, also Brooks. David Uh Trone certainly has a cash advantage. Two best brackets you've ever seen. I mean, I'm still thinking about, like, real basketball. So, okay, sorry, yeah. I can't those, those switch that Those are two fast. fantastic brackets. It's still to come here from the Hill. It is tax time. If you haven't filled out that uh, tax return yet, probably should get on it. But should the IRS be acting, speaking of sports, like NFL referees? Well, the head of the agency says that is how he sees it. The IRS head as the NFL referee. That sound right? You're watching the Hill here on News Nation. Back in a few. Tonight, why did prosecutors in the Rust shooting case pull Alec Baldwin's plea deal? Plus, 8th graders charge criminally for holding a mock slave auction on Snapchat. Jesse Weber, Geraldo Rivera, and News Nation's own Ashley Banfield. Tonight on Dan Abrams Live. All right, welcome back. So Lululemon's stock chart, I guess you could say, starting to look like a downward dog yoga pose. <laughs> the high-end athletic wear maker is projecting a, projecting a slowdown in its U.S. business, driving shares down as much as uh, 15% at one point today. Now, the company's CEO says that American consumers are, quote, a little soft coming into the year, basically a warning on consumer spending, which could have a big impact on the election. It's a bit of a juxtaposition to what we've seen, though, with the stock market this week, with the major indices touching all-time highs uh, at points throughout the week. All right, so is this about consumer spending and like, oh no, the economy might be headed in a bad direction, or are we just sick of $125 a year? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. You know, I, I think it's hard to use Lululemon as an example because yeah. their stuff is so expensive. And look, we have so much, op- op- so many options when it comes to yes. leisure. Aloe, Adidas, Nike, all of that. And I think at one point you say, if you, I can get it cheaper on Amazon, why do I go Jotting this down for Mother's Day. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. for Viore. Like, they've okay. changed the game on the athleisure. You know, I just don't, I'd never buy Lulu. All right. So passe. So two years yeah. ago. Meantime, <laughs> meantime, the tax filing deadline. Uh, less than a month away, and the IRS is after America's wealthiest taxpayers. In a new campaign targeting the rich, the IRS is sending more than 125,000 compliance letters to high-income earners who haven't filed, get this, since 2017. Now, they're even using AI to detect who they are calling (laughs) cheaters. The IRS commissioner says they are just looking out for regular taxpayers. Here's how he explained it to the Associated Press. 
if we are collecting what is owed from the wealthiest taxpayers, it means that others aren't shouldering the burden of funding our government and its many critical activities. We're like the NFL referee. Uh, when we get the call right or wrong, we, we get booed, and, and we're okay with that. Okay with being an NFL referee? I mean, they get the, Scott, they get the calls wrong. They don't look Pretty like awful. NFL referees. <laughs> they say they're never wrong. If it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's not a duck. It's the IRS. <laughs> yeah. You got a problem with them uh, using AI to, to, to try to crack down on Nothing tax cheats? Nothing wrong cheese? with AI as long as they verify it and confirm what they're sending out and what they're using it for. Even in the legal field, the filings for the AI are fine, but the lawyers are required to confirm the names of the cases and the, the, the reality of the case. Americans' views, uh, by the way, on federal taxes, Chris and Julia, two-thirds of U.S. taxpayers say they spend, quote-unquote, too much on federal income taxes. Who, uh, uh, find me the third. third. Find yeah, me where are they? the other third. Who, like, who, who, are, they they just right. who are those humans? And let's make sure they're not AI, right? They could be Exactly. All right. Uh, before we say goodbye, by the way, here's another story that caught our eye. Tim Scott's wedding plans. The senator from South Carolina all set to say I do later this summer in August. And it's it's making some headlines. The Washington Post today writing, quote, Tim uh, Trump's VP prospect, Tim Scott, sets summer wedding date after GOP convention. You're yeah. friends with him. Oh, yeah. We chatted today. And okay. He just sounds you, so You spoke excited. with Tim Scott today. Yep, today. What did he tell you? He just said, I'm so excited. He said, I asked him, is there anything you want me to say in particular? Is there anything you're thinking? And he's just like, I'm just so excited. And honestly, we've been praying for him for so long. Thank you, God, for finally bringing him <laughs> an amazing woman. He's waited 58 years to find her, and she's incredible. What a- and so he's it's going to be awesome. What about the framing of like, well, you know, this could come around the if, if he's the VP nominee in the convention and all that. Do you think he set his wedding plans around that appointment? Maybe yeah. he's been engaged twice, so yeah. sit tight. He may not. It may not <laughs> do it. Oh, oh, you're very good. Yeah, he's yeah. been engaged twice before. Issue with that. Oh, I wish engaged. him all the best. Thank you. Sure. Look, um, certainly I think that there's reason to speculate because of that date. But what I'm asking is, wh- where's the wedding going to be? Is it going to be in South Carolina? Yes. Ask her. She'll probably be there. August in South Carolina. I haven't talked to him about the details. <laughs> <laughs> that's, <laughs> okay, that's going to be a little hot. A little hot, Steve, down there in South Carolina. Yeah. That's more. But he's right. so blissfully couldn't care less <laughs> about what's going on. It's, it's, it's not a swing state. It's not a swing state. By the way, looking ahead to this weekend, the Hill Sunday with Chris Steyerwalt, of course, 10 a.m. Eastern, Sunday morning here on News Nation. Republican senator from West Virginia. Virginia Shelley Moore Capito will be joining the show real quickly. It's too much West Virginians in one show. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if television's ready for that much hillbilly excellence, but we're going to give it a shot. <laughs> we're going to give it a shot. Chris Dyerwall, 10 o'clock Eastern, Sunday morning for The Hill on Sunday. Hope you all have a great weekend. Watch Sunday morning. Oh, I, I do. do. Do it. Absolutely. Yes. Do it. I would right. never Your money back if you don't. <laughs> money back if you don't. There you go. We'll be back here on Monday. Thanks so much for watching us here on The Hill. On Balance with Leland Vitter starts right there.